Good morning. How's it going, guys? Morning. You know what's kind of funny is our first service was more awake, and that was at 9. So I'm assuming we're all not morning people, if we're uh, still waking up right now. Um, just so you know, if this is your uh, first time here, uh, my name is Scott. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, this isn't going to be our, our normal uh, ser- service. Um, we actually had a new series we we're going to start today, but um, unfortunately, uh, of a chain events made it so we had to um, change a couple things. Um, un- unfortunately, our, our, our good pastor George um, just uh, had some real hard tragedy um, with our family uh, just this weekend. Uh, I have a letter um, I'm going to go ahead and read to you guys right now. Uh, I, words can't even express. What, um, so let me just go ahead and start. It says, Dear friends at Whitewater Church, I expected to be preaching with all of you today. The last thing I expected to be doing was writing you this letter. On Friday evening at a routine doctor's appointment for our 17th week of pregnancy, the doctor could not find a heartbeat. After going through a battery of more testing, we found out that Sarah was carrying twins and that both their hearts had stopped a few weeks ago. This had been heartbreaking news for our family. Please keep us in your prayers. It is difficult to put into words both how sad we are, yet how loved and supported we feel. I love you guys so much, and Sarah and I feel so blessed to be part of what God is doing at Whitewater Church. God's love is never more tangible than in the care and support of friendships when we go through pain and loss such as this. God is so good. The best way I can love and lead Whitewater right now is to love and lead my family through this painful time. Scott will do a great job preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in my stead. Please be praying for wisdom and guidance through this time, for our joy in the Lord to endure through pain, especially for healing for my wife Sarah, who is the sweetest gal you'll ever meet. It is hard to watch her heart experience so much hurt. I will look forward to sharing fellowship with all of you next week. Much love, Pastor George. And then below, below on a site, um, if you guys know, he has a, a brother, uh, Evan, who usually uh, does worship, um, plays drums for us. Um, later that day, he ended up falling off his two-story story ledge, um, hit, hit his head so hard, um, he ended up having to go to the emergency room, um, He's, he's doing okay right now, but they found um, uh, bleeding in his brain from it. Um, so he's being monitored right now. They're doing testing, but it's just, um, it's, it's just so much and a lot for their family right now. When, when, I, when I first heard this news, I, uh, I think many of you guys are, are probably feeling right now, my, my heart just sank. Um, it's... So hard dealing with loss. So you think, um, man, why, uh, why God? Why would you allow such a horrible thing to happen? And not only, God, why would you allow a horrible thing to happen? But God, why would you allow such a horrible thing to happen to just a good, godly Christian man? Um, so t- today, as today as we explore, where I'm actually gonna, we're gonna actually ask those tough questions and really, really look what Scripture has to say on on why. Why does God allow such horrible things to happen? Um, and thing thing is, which is um, I think is always interesting, is you know we're we're always we're always happy, and we, we never question or ask why when um, when when God is blessing us. We never ask, you know, why God did I get this raise? Uh, we never ask, you know, why God did you give us safe travels on our on our way home on our way home from a vacation? Um, we're never, we're never saying like, man, God, why, why are we so healthy? Why do you not allow us to be sick? Why is this such a good time? We don't, we don't ask that. Um, we just, we just, it's easy for us to trust and not even question God when things are going so well. But what, what's our attitude when trouble strikes? What's our attitude in the situation when something goes from good to bad to worse? Especially when there's no reason why. Many, you guys have all heard of a sure a family being hit by a drunk driver. Um, 
Or, um, man, someone who's, all, who's stricken with cancer. Why? Um, I don't, I'm sure most, most of you guys heard a few weeks ago with that. Um, in our own community, we had a, a, a youth pastor, his wife, and their, their little daughter were, were, were driving to Bonnie Lake, and all of a sudden just a bridge collapsed right on them. Just, just e- everyday life. Why? 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 Because does such a loving God allow something like that to happen? Just awful. What happens to your faith when bad things happen to good people? And let alone this, what happens to your faith when good things happen to bad people? Have you ever asked why? So today, as, as we open Scripture, um, we're going to be it's, uh, in the book of Job. It's in the Old Testament. Um, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna read about a man who's who gone through things just like this and even worse. Um, it's, in the, it's probably in, a bit in the middle of your Bible. If you hit Psalms, it's the book to the very left of it. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to be in Job chapter 1. All right, Job chapter 1, verse 1. It says, There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 lambs, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in the entire area. Job was a good man. Not only was a good man, but he was, God had blessed Job with more than he could ever imagine. Now go ahead and uh, drop down to verse 6. This is when things get rough. It says, One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been trolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Could you just, could you just imagine just being, being up in heaven, hanging out with God, and all of a sudden Satan comes in to, to the room and just starts conversing and having a conversation with God. Um, it's, it's almost like something you like, see in a movie or a fairy tale, but it, it happens right here in the scriptures. It says, then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his prosperity you have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how, ri- look how rich Job is. But reach out your hand, take away everything he has, and he will surely curse your face. So what does God say? He says, all right. You may test him. The Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Man, this is, this is crazy. It's just un, unfathomable for me, the idea of, of saying, conversing with God in such a way, and then God, like a proud papa, says, hey, have you, have you considered my servant Job? Could you, could you imagine just in, this, in the same place, saying, having that conversation with God? And God, it's all, hey, have you, have you, had my, have you considered my servant Heather? Hey, what about my servant Rick? Have you ever considered doing anything to Rick? Because, man, I know that, that person follows me. Or how about my servant George and Sarah? Have you ever considered them? No pressure, right? No pressure at all? Anyone okay if God puts your name down? Oof. Satan likes us to believe, um, this is what I, what I call toddler rules, is that if we do good things, good things are going to happen to us. And if I do bad things, bad things are going to happen to us. 
So let me, let me just explain a little more on that, what I call toddler rules. Um, my daughter Linnea is three. She understands these rules very much. She just, just finished potty training, um, and she knows when she goes potty, good things will happen. She, she gets riches, which is in the currency of candy right now and chocolate. So any time that she does a good job, she gets chocolate. And in fact, she's so excited about doing a good job, and how I know she does a good job is she goes, I did it! And then she claps for herself like this. <laughs> I think maybe I was clapping for her a little too much before when she was starting it, so this is, that's the routine. You know she went by. And there's sometimes that instead of her clapping going, I did it, I hear, I made a mess! And she does make a mess. And, there, and then let's, let's look at this. This is a bad decision, Linnea. We don't pee all over the floor. Daddy now has to mop this up. There is no chocolate. It's gone. Um, she, she understands if, if, if I do good things, I'm going to get rewarded. And if I do bad things, I'm not going to get those riches. I'm not going to get that candy. And in fact, if I cry and complain and pout about it, even something even worse happens. Um, I went to Ikea. Have you guys ever seen those uh, little tents they have? They're really cute for your kids to play around. Um, we have one. And um, I didn't intend this way, but we call it the crying tent. So anytime she pouts or screams or is upset with the decision that was made because of her poor choices, she's been banished to the crying tent. <laughs> so I'm all, Linnea, you got to go to the crying tent. And of course she's all, no, I don't want to go to the crying tent. And I'm like, go cry now. And then she'll run and scream and cry. And then she can come out when she's done crying. <laughs> so I don't need to hear that all day. I'm just like, here, go ahead to the crying tent. I, um, I'm just looking forward when I get older, when I hear about this, or like, oh, no, Dad, don't bring up the crying tent again. Um, but this, this is the type of thinking that Satan wants us to think. Um, it, it drives me nuts when I hear teachers say, hey, you know, do the right thing, you'll be rich. Hey, read your Bible and you'll be driving that new Cadillac that you've always been talking about. It, it's just not true. Bad things can happen to good people and there doesn't need to be an explanation. Whether, um, it doesn't necessarily be that God's testing you. It doesn't necessarily have to be just because. It could be that, hey, this is just going to, God has a reason that maybe that we just can't see. Just because something good happens to you doesn't mean we deserve it. Neither does bad stuff happen to you just because you deserve it. In the next two, um, in, in the rest of this chapter, in the next chapter, we see that Joe loses everything. He loses his riches. He loses his children, his health. It gets to a point that his, the only thing that's still there is his wife, which I don't think was, wonder if that was a good thing or a bad thing that Satan kept her alive. But she says, curse God and die. So even his wife abandons him. And here's the interesting part. Job never read the first two chapters of Job. He never understood why. God, why did you allow this into my life? Why did you take everything I had away from me? And I think when we go through pain and we ask why, I think the most toughest pain we can go through is when we don't have an answer to why. If there's a good reason on why something happened, it's easier for us to follow God. It's easier for us to understand, easier for us to cope when we've been hurt and we know someone who's, who's gone through a loss. But when we don't know why, when there's no reason, I, I think it's just one of the most toughest pains that we can go through. And as a society, I think we're, we're just so why-driven people. I think, um, man, if, uh, if you guys were here, um, we used to, before we moved here, we're actually we're in a building at Puyallup High School. And then on a Sunday morning in January, George says, hey, guys, we're going to go ahead and we're going to be moving to this building. And if George shared the why. If George just came and said, hey, by the way, guys, we're moving. Um, see you in March and walked away. People were like, wait, why, why are we moving? This is, this is such a great location. Everything's working out. Why would we want to change? And then, and then when we got here, um, George shared, shared at the high school in February, March, says, hey, we got to get that building ready for company. We, the, the bathrooms are disgusting. They're horrible. If, if he didn't share the why that the men's bathroom looked like 
like you'd rather go to a Circle K and people are writing on their connection cards, I love your church, but I can't go to the bathroom, there would, there, it would be a good explanation on why are we building and why are we working on this bathroom. It, the same thing can go for um, our, our sign ministry. We have people that put signs throughout, all, all throughout downtown. If George didn't share, hey, well, you know what? The majority of people who come to our church on their connection card, they say that they saw the sign and that's how they found our church. If we don't know that why, we question it. We question the trust. Why am I spending my Saturday morning putting out this sign and hoping not to get hit by a car or someone upset that I put my blinker on and I had to stop traffic just to put this out? But if I know that someone may come to Christ and come to the church because of it, it, makes, it changes our motivation. It changes the why. Um, man, just think, look, look how neat everything is happening in this building. Because the, the why of George shared it, hey, we're going to be able to have this all day Sunday. We're going to have this on Wednesday nights for everybody. We're going to save money, and we're going to grow, and we have. But if George didn't share that why, we would question, and it would be harder for us just to trust in what God is doing if we're not able to get that why. And I love, uh, again, with my daughter, and I don't know if every, if you either have dealt with toddlers or you know toddlers or you've had toddlers, um, I think there's something called the, the why stage that they go through. Um, some of you guys are nodding your head. You're dealing with that horribleness right now. Um, but the, it's, the why is everything. And her favorite time to ask Daddy why is while we're driving. Daddy's trying to, you know, safe down the road, and I keep getting why, 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 why. And, it's, and, and this is a hard thing. Is I don't know if you ever um, noticed, but there's something called traffic lights. Well, every time it gets red, Linnea has to ask again, why did we stop? And sometimes when you go down Meridian, there's a lot of lights. So there's a lot of, why did we stop? And then so I'm like, well, Linnea, uh, what color? She's all, it's red. I'm all, yes, what does red mean? She's all, says stop. She's like, well, why did you stop? I'm like, well, Linnea, let me go into explanations of what a traffic accident is and how, let me explain safety and traffic rules to you and why if we go down this intersection right now at the red light, we might get hit by a car. Well, why would it get hit by a car? I'm like, well, let me explain that the other person has a green light and as they're going through... <laughs> They're going to hit us, and then we may get in a car accident. No, let alone we may get a ticket. And when we get the ticket, the officer is not going to want to be paid in chocolate. It's just, why, why not in chocolate, Daddy? Everybody loves chocolate. Well, let me explain again. <laughs> chocolate melts. You can't really keep it. It's not going to last. Um, I, get, I hear this why over and over again. And yet, I don't know if you ever have gone, gone this way as a parent, or you, if you're a parent, I'm sure you or if you're a child, I'm sure you've at least have heard this once for your parents, when they say, because I said so. And I get to a point in myself where I say, because I said so, and I'll say, just trust me. There's a reason why we're not going through the red light right now. Just because I said so. The only problem is sometimes it backfires, and I ask her, Linnea, why did you make this big mess? She's all, because I said so. <laughs> well, you can't say the word, I said so. Why can't I use the word, I said so? Oh. If you, if you know how to break the habit, talk to me afterwards. Um, I, I have to say, you know, I think when we ask this why, why does bad things happen, I think sometimes there's reasons that are hidden in view or that only heaven can see. There, we don't know the whole story, and God is expecting us to trust him when bad things happen. To the point that, God's reputation may be riding on our reaction. How do we respond when we do not get a reason? Here's, here's how Job responds in uh, Job 1.20. It says, Job responds with this after all this had happened. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell on the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. When we go through pain, just like Job, we, we have two options. I can either run towards God, or I can run completely away from him. Job chose in this, in this situation that, God, I'm going to remain faithful and watch you, even with him not knowing the why. 
every, every reaction that we make when something bad happens, um, we, we have to be strategic about it. Let me say it. Every, every reaction, we got to be strategic. And what I mean by that is people are watching us. People are watching how you handle every situation in life. Whether that's you're driving down the road and you blow a tire and they see you down the road. Um, whether it's the um, situation of your child or spouse saying, by the way, I just wrecked the family car. Um, whereas how, how, do you, how do you react when you know that someone's been lying about you and everyone's talking about that lie? Or how do you react when you know a loved one or you yourself are, have been stricken with just, just a sickness that shouldn't be? People are watching us and seeing how we're going to react when we go through hard times. And those that are here, Christians especially, they're going to be watching. Are you going to fold when bad things happen? Or are we going to remain faithful? And guys, I, I, can, I can say through the, the bottom of my heart, I, I completely understand what it means to go through hard times. I know what it's like, and I, and I understand some of the shoes you guys are in. I know some of you guys are hurting right now, and you're like, Scott, you have no idea or understand what I'm going through. Well, um, I, have a, I have a younger brother named Aaron, and um, uh, ten, ten years ago we had a, a real tragedy. Uh, my brother, just, he just got off work at um, Kmart. That was ten years ago, so they existed back then. And then... Um, when he go ahead, he called, he called his girlfriend and said, hey, you know, mind if I hang out with you until you get off work? She said, sure. So my brother ended up going to Target and hanging out with her, and he was actually going to take her home. And his girlfriend at the time, she's like, you know, let me call my dad real quick. Let me just make sure it's okay that, that you take me home. Uh, so she calls her dad and says, hey, is it okay if Aaron takes me home? And he says, no. I don't want him taking you home, but I will go ahead and I will pick you up. And she said, well, can you at least just hang out with me in the parking lot until you come? And he said, that's fine, go ahead. So uh, brother's girl, girlfriend at the time, her, her dad comes driving by, um, comes to pick her up, and before anything hap- um, goes to pick her up or exchange any words or anything, he rolls down his window, he takes out a gun, and he takes my brother's life. And didn't say a word, didn't explain anything, just took my brother's life. And then after that, he ends up driving away. And while driving away, a high, highway, high, highway chase ends up starts happening. Um, the guy ends up losing control of his vehicle, hits a guardrail, and in that moment, he decides to reload his gun and take his own life. And then my, my, senior, my, high, my senior year of high school, my week before I graduate, at midnight, we get a knock on the door. My dad opens it, and there's a police officer trying to identify to see if he's the father of Aaron and has to let us know right then and there that he's no longer with us. It's so hard not knowing why would God take away my brother. Um, so hard now as I get older and I have children and um, he won't see them grow up. Um, or I can't tell, I can't ask him or experiences like, man, what is going on with your wife? Am I, am I crazy in my marriage right now? I can't, I can't ask him advice on things. I can't see how he's doing. Um, actually, it just breaks my heart so much and then see... The pain it went on my family. It 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 it, it tore, tore my family apart. Things were said that they never wanted said before. Um, th- things that have have caused div- divisions in my family till till today. Um, but but God allowed it to happen, guys. Life on Earth is so short that we never know when we're going to die. We never know when our time is up. Like, like Job saying, naked I came and naked I'll depart. The only thing that's going to matter when we die is what we did, on, did with this life on earth. Don't wait to explore a relationship with Jesus. Find, find out now what that's like. We, we don't know how much time we have. And the little time we have matters for e- eternity. Let me go ahead and demonstrate um, after, after I lost my brother, um, uh, I went, I heard a pastor teaching, and this really hit me so much. Um, 
Uh, this, this little red tip here, he's all, imagine that's your, um, that's your time on earth, that little tip. Imagine the rest of this low rope. This is, this is eternity. Everything you do for this, this little moment, this little brief of time that we have earth, is going to affect us for all of eternity. So with the small amount of time that we have, what are we going to do with that life? And when tragedy things happen, am I going to go towards God or am I going to go away from Him? Because that's what the enemy wants. The enemy wants us to cause a wedge and division against us and God. Satan is never going to admit that God alone is only worthy to be worshipped. And he has accused God of stacking the deck. He says, hey, the only way that that you're going to follow God is if he blesses you. And if you're not being blessed, God wants nothing to do with you. He'll make you think that either God is testing you or God is just just trying to be that that mean kid with a magnifying glass burning ants. And that's, that's, that's what Satan wants to make you think. He doesn't want to make you think he loves you. He doesn't want to make you think he cares about you. And he doesn't ever want to think that whatever tragedy or hardship you've gone through that like God can't use that for his glory or take and make it good. Uh, because of the loss of my brother, um, I, end up, I, end up teach, um, I end up teaching and sharing the gospel to hundreds of people for the first time at his funeral. And it was after I got down, um, I had so many people saying, Scott, have you ever thought of being a preacher? Have you ever thought of being a pastor? I never would have ever even had the consideration of ever being on stage. I hated being on stage. I never would talk to a group of people. If it wasn't for my brother's death, I never would be here today. Because of my brother's death, I get to share this story today and hopefully bring some truth in your guys' hearts and lives. And I'm thankful that because of my brother's loss, I can understand the hardships some of you guys are going through right now. I can understand, I can talk to someone who's gone through loss. It's very hard, at least in my situation, it's very hard talking to someone who doesn't know what you're going through and hasn't actually experienced it themselves. I don't want you guys to think, God didn't allow what happened to George and Sarah to test them, but what God has taken that was something that was bad, God will make it into good. In uh, Genesis 50, um, we're reminded when, when Joseph says, that you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. People are watching right now, George and Sarah, and, they, and they're watching how are they reacting to the situation that just happened to them today. How are they acting after losing, losing, losing their children right now? How are they acting where their brother has now fallen off a ledge and is in the hospital? I think it's a bold statement that George and Sarah decided to put their family first right now. And we, we were so excited for this, this new series. We've been doing months of planning. And then, and then last, um, yesterday in the afternoon, I got, I got the call. I talked with George, and he's like, I need to spend my time with my family. i I got to be the example right now. People are watching what George and Sarah are doing. Um, People are going to watch what we as Christians do. They're going to watch to see, you know, is, is God a priority? Um, are, do, they, um, do, they, do, they, do they find time, times to be with, with each other for their family? Do they find times to go to church? and make, Is church a priority on Sunday? Um, is reading the Bible a priority? I hated, um, when I was a kid, my, my dad would force me to go to church all the time until I realized and understood the priority of going to church. And then... Um, what I say is unfortunate. We had this uh, lady come to church once two, two, two weeks before her death. She's in a wheelchair. She's in an oxygen mask. And my dad says, if she can make it to church, you can make it to church. Um, and that's hit me to this day. My dad would read his Bible every, 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 um, every afternoon after he got off work. And that hit me every day as I, I saw the importance of being in the Word because I was watching my dad. I was watching to see how he reacts and it caused to help me be the person I am today. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to end with this. Um, 2 Timothy 
chapter 2. It's in the New Testament if you want to go ahead and flip to the end. 2, and I'm going to start in verse 8. And this is uh, Paul's talking to uh, Timothy, who's one he's been mentoring while he's in prison. Paul says, Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is good news I preach. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. I love over and over where George... um, he talked about it a few months ago, and it's hit me this day. He said, you know, the, the currency of the kingdom is relationships. And what matters the most is, our, with our small time on earth, is who, who, who have we loved on? Who have we helped when we're hurting? Who, who have we visited in prison? Who have we given a meal to? Um, the impact we made is, as Job said, you know, naked I came from the moon, naked I shall depart. We don't get to bring anything with us when we go to heaven. But what's going to matter is how did we live our life with other people? Who did we talk to when we were hurting? And if I know where it says, so I will endure anything if it brings salvation, eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen, how could I not want to follow Christ if I know that something I may do may help someone lead to salvation? You know, I I think... At, 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 man, at, at times it, it can be so easy for us to say, yeah, I'll be, I'll be a martyr for Christ, but man, um, I, I, I can't imagine. But if, if I knew that something I'm doing, why going to church, the people I talk to, um, you know, loving on someone, taking them out for coffee, if I knew there's a chance that they may, build a, the, they may bring salvation, if I know that if, if, with my brother passed away, if I know at least one person found Christ because of it, for me that would be worth it. That would be something worthy of dying for if I knew that people found Jesus because of, because of his death, because if, if something were to happen to me, the same thing. In verse 13, I love it. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. You know, we, we're, we're sinners. We're, we're not always going to react the way that we should. Uh, and when situation arises, when we are unfaithful to God, He is still faithful to us. He's still a proud papa of us. He loves us. He cares for us. I, just, I love that aspect of we have a God that even if we are faithless, He will remain faithful to each and every one of us. So my challenge for you guys this week We as a church, um, and I just I want to be able to come alongside as a, lo- a loving family to George and Sarah. Um, and I'll get, get to how we're going to do what I'd like to do in a minute for that. But um, if you guys know someone who's hurting in your life, um, someone who's I've lost a child, they're um, losing marriages or losing their home, um, financial issues, would you, could you at least bless one person this week? Uh, at Whitewater Church, we, we talk about that we want to be known as a hospital, not a university. How neat it would be is if people knew us as a church, that when people are hurting, that they came and they would run to us instead of just going the opposite direction, and that we were a church that helped and hurt those that are in need. So I ask that you would just do for one person this week. And if, and if you are hurting, if you are in need today, would you come and talk to us afterwards? Would you let us know? Because... If we're going to be a hospital, that means we've got we to gotta do what we say and we want to be able to help you. And if you don't feel comfortable, um, talk to one of us. Just write on your connection card what's going on. We'd love to be able to pray with you if you just want prayer. We'd love to get in contact with you. It's something financially. We're, we're supposed to be a church. We're a body of believers, and we want to help those that are in need. But unless we know the need, we're not going to be able to help fulfill it. So um, what, what I'd like to do... Um, 
uh, while uh, before the worship, um, when the worship starts, is we have, um, I, I think the, the, I was talking with George, and the best thing right now is just, is just prayer and encouragement for George and Sarah. So uh, during worship, we have um, uh, paper in the back, and I have pens, and I have envelopes. I'm, I'm just going to ask, could you write at least one, one encouragement for George and Sarah? Um, or could you, um, it could even be like, hey, just one word, hey, I'm, I'm praying for you. I love you guys. Um, that, I think, I know that would just mean the world to them. Um, they don't even know we're doing this, is, is if we got to drop off all these letters of encouragement to know that people are praying for them and they care about George and Sarah. So if you do that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, close in prayer. And if you could do that, we have tables in the back when during worship. You go ahead and just, if you just write a few things of encouragement for George and Sarah, I, I know it would mean the world to them. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for, um, for loving us. Um, God, I, it's so hard to ask the wise Lord, but God, I, I, I ask that um, in this situation, um, something that was bad, can you take it to good and for your glory? And for us that are hurting, they're going through hard times right now, can you take that situation, our situations right now, use it for our glory, let us know that you are there, that you are with us, and that you, things, things will pan out for your glory and your goodness, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.